But uh, so um, I think I've met everybody uh, talking about anorectal anatomy. The, the reason for this, and I think I've explained it before, but the goal of these is to prepare you guys for the next week's big Monday lecture. We didn't do one before Schaffner's GERD lecture um, for various reasons, but next week, Dr. Markell will talk for an hour about benign anorectal you know, pathology and pathophysiology and, and management. Um, so I won't really belabor that stuff all that much. It'll really be kind of a focus on anatomy. Hopefully a lot of this stuff is really review for folks. Um, but, and then really um, after this, folks are free to go, free to stay uh, for the ones and twos. And I'm gonna just give a little brief talk about kind of my perspective on how I think um, or one way to prepare for the app site. Um, then those sorts of things. So um, we'll kind of, we'll focus a lot on anatomy basically is really what we're, we're actually not gonna talk about continence and incontinence. I, um, when I was making this last night, I didn't take that out, but we're not gonna talk about it today. So just forget that it's there. And then um, we'll briefly talk about abscesses and fistulae more so um, in terms of the anatomic spaces they occupy. We won't get all the way into kind of some of the management principles, but we'll touch on some of those things. Um, but some of the finer points um, I'll let Dr. Markell discuss. So in terms of, you know, the anatomy of the anus and rectum, this is really, um, I mean, you hear people talk a lot about, you know, colon stuff general surgeons can do and, and like to do and, and do frequently. It's really the, the complexity of the anorectal anatomy that warrants pursuit of a colorectal fellowship. You know, you, you do this entire extra year of training really so that you have specific expertise and understanding of probably the last 15 centimeters of the GI tract. And that's not to belittle a colorectal fellowship. It's just to imply that there is a lot of complexity in terms of what's going on. So in terms of the definition of the rectum, uh, it begins at kind of the splaying of the tineae near the sacral promontory, but really the, the landmark you're looking for is the splaying of the tineae coli. Um, in terms of its average length, anywhere from 18 to 12 centimeters, a, a, a general average that lots of people will quote is about 15 centimeters in length. Um, you see here in this image, it depicts it nicely, but the kind of upper two thirds, excuse me, of the anterior rectum are, are peritoneal eyes. With kind of that blue hue and reflection in the image you see. Um, and then laterally, it's really only the upper third or so. And then posteriorly, obviously it's predominantly extra peritoneal in nature. Um, and it's, it's also in the lateral stalks where you will find, you know, the named rectal vessels that become important when dividing the rectum or isolating the rectum surgically for things like an LAR or an APR. Um, in terms of the, the fascias, you know, Denon Villiers fascia or the anterior fascia is in here. It's generally a little more flimsy. Uh, obviously, if this were a woman, uh, this would be the rectovaginal fistula, or fistula, rectovaginal fascia, excuse me. Um, <laughs> And in men, um, you can call it um, rectoprostatic or, or just a non is is kind of a, a gender neutral name if you wanna use that. Um, and then posteriorly is Waldire's fascia um, for, for those interested, but those, those things do come up. Waldire's fascia is uh, really the presacral fascia. It's much more dense. Um, it's not so, so flimsy. Uh, that's probably kind of the area to get into that plane and some stuff that had to be broken up that was actually discussed in M&M where Dr. Shogui had to kind of like bluntly ram his hand posteriorly. It's not a subtle uh, layer. And then something else that will come up frequently is uh, endorectal ultrasound or rectal EUS. Um, it's, I think something that can be difficult for a lot of people, especially because we talk about light and dark bands and then the probe itself has like 15 of them that you don't need to worry about. So people start counting here and this is stuff that can all be ignored. This is not, you know, the, the actual anatomy we're interested, that's all out here. I tried to line these images up so that hopefully they, they work, but basically kind of the mucosa is your first bright layer. Every muscular layer should be dark because muscle has lots of water content and that's, that's what is dark on ultrasound. But the first layer is not gonna be your muscularis propria, right? It will be your muscularis mucosa. Here labeled as the deep mucosa, but your muscularis mucosa. And then the submucosa, muscularis propria, and then the adventitia. And so if you were to look at this image, you can see here kind of right where my cursor sits is uh, epithelium. And then, oh, I went away. Okay. Um, muscularis mucosa, submucosa, muscularis propria. And then this kind of white is gonna be 
serosa and adventitia, periadventitial tissues, and then out here it would be kind of perirectal tissues. So you can see here it's pretty uniform around this rectal specimen all the way around. Um, oh, I gave it away. But um, you, you might say, you know, if anyone didn't see that, what layer this tumor probably invades? They don't have a, a decent guess. So it looks like it clearly goes through the epithelium, muscularis mucosa. It looks like it goes through the submucosa, or it looks like it's contained in the muscularis propria, right? You don't see violation of this adventitia out here. So, so it invades the muscularis propria, and then does anyone know what the T stage would be of this tumor? Does anyone know the T stages for rectal cancer? Same as colon cancer. T2, right? So T1 invades the submucosa, T2 invades muscularis propria, T3 invades the periadventitial tissues, and T4 is adjacent organs. So there'd be a UT2. Generally, though, if faced with a rectal cancer, the more modern uh, recommendation would be to get a pelvic MRI, but EUS is something that does still show up frequently. That's something that I think is confusing for lots of people. And so hopefully this slide is kind of a useful reference. Um, in terms of the anatomy of the, yes. Uh, yeah, it, you could also say it's a CT too, because it's clinical stage. But U would be kind of a way that it, it should come up on a, a report. Um, so the, the distal most cavity now, so the anal canal, in terms of that's anatomy, really what defines the beginning of the anal canal is the levator ani muscles. It's three to five centimeters in length, um, you know, with some obviously kind of individual variation. And what defines this space really is that it's, it's surrounded by the sphincter muscles the, and the levators. So it's important to remember, and it, it helps, I think, make sense in terms of the innervation and control of these sphincters, but the internal sphincter is really an extension of the inner circular smooth muscle of the rectum, right? I mean, you can see this muscle here kind of all highlighted in an orange fashion, and it, it really is just a continuum, at which point down low in the anal canal, below kind of the level of the levators, it's renamed the internal anal sphincter. And then externally, you have the external sphincter, but at the superior most aspect, it's really an extension of the puborectalis muscle and kind of an extension of the levator ani muscles. Um, superiorly, uh, this internal sphincter is, is wrapped by the levators themselves, and then inferiorly, it's going to be wrapped by the of the external sphincter. Um, a brief word about the histology of the, the anal canal. Um, some of this is really just um, whether or not you recall it from medical school, but um, so within the anal canal, uh, there's kind of the need to lubricate stool for uh, ease of passage and those sorts of things. And to do so, we all have uh, anal glands seen here that uh, live within these kind of anal crypts and then the crypts are interspersed between what are called these columns of morgagni. And, and a lot of that anatomy is important in what is called the cryptoglandular theory or, or cryptoglandular um, postulate of how anal rectal abscesses form in terms of those, those uh, crypts or glands becoming obstructed and that mucus not having a safe way to kind of egress. And so it accumulates in an inherently always dirty space. And it, uh, allows one to, to form an abscess that may or may not decompress by means of a uh, fistula and anal. Um, but does anyone know kind of the, the histology of the anal canal proximal to the dentate line? Well, that would be if it was cancer. Yeah, just columnar epithelium um, with those crypts and anal glands. And then the anal, the, the dentate line or, or that whole space is kind of a, a transition zone um, honestly, analogous to the Z-line at the GE junction and other transition zones anywhere else in the body. Uh, distal to the dentate, I think, Christine, you were saying it. And is, it, um, is there another way that we further subclassify squamous epithelium? Yeah, it's non right? Um, and then uh, that'll often be referred to as just enoderm. Uh, that's kind of a, a medical term for that. If you see that, that's referring to the squamous portion of the anal canal. Um, and then distal to the anal verge. 
yeah yeah not overly complex um and then um that also is a line uh at which you should start to see kind of the hair bearing skin of, of the anus or anal margin does anyone know what kind of what defines the anal margin yeah it's a five centimeter circumferential area so this comes up um because there can be cancers within this space and really a cancer um whether it was proximal to the dentate distal to the dentate uh, or within the anal margin may or may be managed differently. It would change the expected histology of that cancer. Uh, you know, we're talking about the potential for at least three different treatment algorithms within about a three centimeter space, uh, depending on what you find at the time of your anoscopy, proctoscopy, and biopsy. So it, it seems kind of trivial to just recite this anatomy by rote, but it is actually really important. Uh, and I can share these slides with anybody. Um, in terms of the, the pelvic floor muscles, um, you know, the levator ani, it's frequently referred to as if it's one thing, but it is really the collection of multiple muscles. Um, can anyone list for me any of the levators? Yep. I'm just not displaying that because it will come in reverse order, but you can keep going. So sacrococcygeus um, is a muscle of the pelvic floor. It doesn't really form uh, part of the levators per se. Um, but that is that is a good one. Uh, let's see. So no. So but that so there is no issue erectilis. But but really these are all named for their connections, right? And so if you think about it, the way that I remember it is you kind of just march forward from the the coccyx to the pubis, right? So you have your pubococcygeus, or excuse me, excuse me, iliococcygeus will be the most posterior because we we'll go from the kind of the ileal spine to the coccyx. And then you have your pubococcygeus, which would be one in front. It would go from the pubis to the coccyx. And then puborectalis is the one that literally is kind of a sling posteriorly and is in continuity with the external anal sphincter. And um, it, it's important in terms of kind of understanding where these patients can have defects on um, things like anorectal manometry, um, and not that we do or need to do a whole lot of uh, defecography in, in general surgery, but it can come up sometimes on colorectal rotations in terms of operative planning and understanding patient's continence and incontinence before you potentially do an operation for which one of the risks postoperatively can be worsening incontinence. But um, the, the innervation of this area, I, I really won't belabor it, but it's, it's complicated um, from a number of different sources that are both sympathetic and parasympathetic, and then the sacral nerve roots really two, three, and four, but predominantly three and four will be what is innervating this area. But it is worth knowing uh, kind of the muscles that make up your levators. The, the spaces that are kind of created within the levators, and we'll come back to this when we talk about um, abscesses. Uh, one of these pictures will, will come back up. But um, so from an, an AP view and then from a lateral view, um, you know, you have really kind of, you have a superficial or perianal space. And, and that's, just one space, sorry, I didn't realize that was quite so blurry, but um, frequently people will get discussed or posted for the operating room and someone will say perianal abscess. A perianal abscess only implies that it is the most distal superficial space that's involved. Frequently when you're encountering someone in the emergency department, they're in so much pain, you can't examine them. It's, I mean, unless they will let you, it's kind of cruel to do a DRE if you think someone has a perirectal abscess, it's incredibly painful. So just um, for kind of, Speaking clearly, I would refer to these as perirectal abscesses, not perianal abscesses, right? You don't actually know what space is involved. The perianal space being your superficial most uh, kind of submucosal space. There's a, let me see what I have next. So yes, there's an intersphincteric space here, kind of between the internal and external anal sphincters. That is probably going to be the most commonly involved, as one can imagine. That's kind of right where those anal glands and crypts sit. That's a very common source to be kind of the nidus of these abscesses. You have your ischiorectal space uh, that is here, and we'll talk about it can communicate posteriorly. So there's a superficial postanal space and a deep postanal space. If you can imagine this ischiorectal space communicates with the contralateral ischiorectal space posteriorly by way of these spaces. So that's how one could form a horseshoe abscess. Uh, and then there is the supralevator space. And so just a couple of things. Um, the inner sphincteric space does 
communicate superiorly with the superlevator space um, potentially. It's not something, it's not a, a connection that I would go making at the time of addressing a perirectal abscess, but it is one that can exist if you're thinking you have inadequate source control or incomplete resolution of a patient who you thought maybe presented initially with just an interstenteric abscess. Um, and then similarly, the, um, the deep postanal space is separated from the superficial postanal space by this important landmark uh, called the anal coccygeal ligament. And that will come up a lot if you're ever having to address a horseshoe abscess. Uh, it's something that has to be divided to get into that space. You might hear us talk about it in conference. If you're making a posterior incision, you're trying to get into the deep postanal space, you have to divide the anal coccygeal ligament. Otherwise, you, you won't train your abscess adequately. Uh, and it's something that I think makes a lot of people uncomfortable because it is a, a thick fibrous band and you think you're behind the rectum and that you're going to pop into something. You're going to pop into an extra peritoneal pelvic space that is infected. So that's accurate, but you're not going to hurt anything. Um, and then in terms of the uh, arterial anatomy, this all becomes important really when understanding um, rectal cancer primarily, um, but also in terms of the, the blood supply to any resection and kind of the risk of devascularization and those sorts of things. Um, so if the labeling on this slide is very busy, you don't need to take away all of these arteries by any means. Um, and I guess it honestly discloses the answers to the questions I'm about to ask. But um, does anyone know kind of what portion of the rectum the superrectal artery supplies? Since Ryan answered all those questions, Tess, maybe? What portion of the rectum does the superrectal artery uh, supply? And really the predominance of the rectum is, is what it will supply. It will supply really the predominance of the rectum and even some of the, the uppermost anal canal will come from the superior rectal artery, which is off of the IMA. How about the middle rectal artery, Carson? More or less, yeah. So the middle rectal artery also comes in laterally. Some people think it doesn't exist in every patient. Uh, it's kind of an area of controversy, I guess, but uh, it, it'll supply the distal most rectum and then the the predominance of the anal canal. And then um, Alan, the, the inferior rectal artery, they're just kind of marching down uh, for the most part. And then, so that, so that will be kind of exclusively the anal canal and especially the distal most anal canal. And then there's a lot of rich kind of submucosal communications and intramural communications. It's very hard to truly devascularize the rectum, uh, but the same kind of pattern will come up when we talk about the lymphatic drainage of the area. Um, the venous anatomy is a little bit more mixed in terms of the, the portal and systemic uh, drainage. Um, I guess, Jamie, do you know kind of the, the means of drainage for the superior two thirds of the rectum? Um, the that goes into what? The, the... No, uh, it goes into the IMV, which then goes into the portal system, right? So. So this lighter, kind of almost white on the screen, this is the, the portal system. The blue is, is the iliocable system. And so here you see the superior rectal vein drains into the IMV, which should go up and meet splenic vein before forming your portal vein. So really the, the upper two thirds or so of the rectum is, is gonna predominantly have portal venous drainage. Um, and then how about cat, kind of the, the lower third of the, of the rectum? Right. And so. It's, it's pertinent and it will kind of be analogous for this last part, the lymphatic drainage. When we think about rectal cancers, this also kind of explains potentially how someone could have a rectal cancer with pulmonary mets and no liver mets, right? That's something to think about because otherwise that would make no sense if it was exclusively a portal drainage pattern. Um, and so for the lymphatic drainage of the superior and middle rectum, this will primarily go uh, to the IMA, uh, nodes and lymphatics, you know, eventually through the portal system. The lower rectum is something that will drain, it will drain both really via the IMA, but also the internal iliac nodes. And so you can imagine if someone has a metastasis that, you know, some tumor cell gets into the blood and it uh, reaches the internal iliac veins, IVC, heart, into the lungs, and then you have someone with a distal rectal cancer and an isolated pulmonary nodule. That's a way that that makes, you know, pretty clear sense. Whereas you know, any other form of 
colon cancer, it would be kind of anachronistic to have an isolated pulmonary met without liver mets. You're probably just not able to see liver mets that are occult. Um, and then does anyone know the lymphatic drainage of the anal canal proximal to the dentate line? Uh, Zach? No, so, but if you think about, so it's going to be just below the lower third of the rectum and that, that is starting to involve the internal iliac nodes. So that will primarily be the internal iliac nodes. And that's how kind of these low rectal cancers, it kind of follows the same path. But how about distal to the dentate line, Christina? Frank, anyone? Use of students? Yes, yeah, it'll be to the superficial inguinal nodes, right? And so it's very pertinent when you're evaluating a patient in clinic Right, because I mean, we're I, I'm making a big point about you know portal drainage, systemic drainage, liver mets, lung mets. None of that will come up on your physical exam unless someone has like hemoptysis or jaundice, which is like really problematic. But the the point being, if you're evaluating someone with a, a rectal or especially an anal cancer in clinic, uh, Frank, what what should you what should be part of your exam if they have an anal cancer and you're seeing them in clinic? based on this last bullet point. Yeah, you, you need to do a groin exam. You do, because people won't. And missing positive lymph node disease, especially if they have some form of an anal adenocarcinoma, would be a difference maker in their treatment, right? You would give that patient neoadjuvant therapy versus doing a cancer operation that they may not need versus will not warrant for at least three months. So those things are important. Um, and so distal to the dentate line, um, the, the drainage will be to the, um, really to the superficial inguinal nodes. And that will also come up um, for melanomas of the anal canal uh, is actually probably where you'd see it most commonly. Uh, but there will be patients also who, I mean, they'll have a melanoma of the trunk and you can't tell where the nodes are draining and you need to actually examine like their supraclavicular, their axillary, their inguinal nodal basins bilaterally. Yeah. Yeah. I had a case of that intern year and um, yeah spend a lot of time with the patient, but like it's better than, than missing something. Um, in terms of the innervation, I don't have a whole lot of slides left. Um, so the, the Meisner's plexus, this is something that just really comes up for test taking purposes, but it's a submucosal plexus. Our box is the myenteric plexus or the, that which is within the muscularis. Um, this is the plexus that you're, you're looking for, kind of the, the presence or absence in making a diagnosis of Hirschsprung's disease for a suction rectal biopsy. Uh, another confirmatory study uh, in the absence of obvious, uh, excuse me, ganglion cells would be the presence of a positive acetylcholinesterase stain. Sometimes Dr. Gallagher will ask you that. Um, so like negative nerves, positive acetylcholinesterase stain. Um, and then in terms of the pelvic splanchnic nerves, those are your parasympathetics and your lumbar and sacral plexus are your, your sympathetics. Um, okay, so just one brief slide again, about innervation. So the, the external sphincter or kind of an extension of the puborectalis, this is striated muscle. So it, it's, I think, a little easier to remember that it's under voluntary control. Um, it's really innervated by an inferior branch of the internal pudendal nerve. Um, and then the internal sphincter, you know, again, if it's a continuation of the smooth muscle within the wall of your lowermost rectum, it then makes sense that it is under involuntary control. And the resting conformation for your internal sphincter is contracted. That's initially, you know, it, it's not just that like colorectal surgeons like to do DREs and then ask someone to squeeze. It's that you're asking them to control different sphincters. So when you insert your finger, their resting tone, you're palpating their internal sphincter. When you ask them to squeeze, you're checking their external sphincter. That's the purpose of that part of the rectal exam. And that can help you make determinations about their risk of postoperative incontinence. For instance, if they have good tone initially, but no squeeze, that might be someone who is a bad candidate for an internal sphincterotomy, right? So things to, things to think about in terms of the innervation in your exam and how it affects your decision making. Um, and then, so I just have two last brief slides about um, abscesses and fistula and ano. So abscesses are named for the spaces that they occupy. Um, so starting kind of at the bottom, the superficial most space, uh, that this line is marking. Can anyone kind of tell me what that space is again? Yeah, yeah, what's the name of this lowermost space? Sorry? Yep. And then the next one up, intersphincteric, yep. Next one. 
I'm sorry. So that that is a, a, a the deep post anal space will communicate with this space. No. Yes, ischial rectal fossa, uh, and then the su superior most. Yeah, and then I I won't um, go through every method to treat these, but it's important when you when you talk about kind of the preferred method of drainage. So superficial or perianal, you can just drain them. Inner sphincteric, uh, right? One would not want to divide the external sphincter to get to that. So what would your preferred method of drainage be? You just, yeah, exactly. Make an incision intraanal through the internal sphincter, get to that and drain it that way. Uh, and then ischial rectal, those can be drained externally. To drain horseshoe abscesses, some people describe the need for kind of counter incisions, one over each ischial rectal space, and then posteriorly, that midline incision over the deep postanal space. And then how about a supralevator abscess? That would also be one that you would drain internally. Yeah. That's one that frequently, if you're you know, intra op, and you have your retractor in place, you might kind of feel over the area of maximal induration and then with a needle on a syringe kind of insert it and aspirate so that you're sure that you're localizing before you just make an incision that high up on the anal rectal canal. But um, so it's important, right? Because you can't just kind of blow through all this stuff to get to these spaces. You have to think about where you're gonna approach these things and kind of be specific in the language you use, especially also in communicating what kind of abscess is found to other providers. I think honestly, that's something that as general surgeons, we don't always do a very good job of. And our colorectal faculty will get honest about it and rightfully so, because otherwise someone can kind of be set up for inadequate treatment or treatment failure. And then, so fistula and ano. Um, so I guess one question, you're taking some of the OR for a, a perirectal abscess. Um, what, what frequency would you quote them for the likelihood of, you know, in a month having a fistula? Yeah, honestly, that's what I quote patients. I think the literature says like 30 to 40%. I tell them 50, 50. Um, and, and then they come back and they're like, they're really angry. Like you gave me this fistula. What would you tell them? Not necessarily Kevin, anyone else can answer, but you can also answer. Well, just, they said like, what you, you did, yeah, you did the wrong surgery, man. Like you, you gave me officially, you did the wrong surgery. What are you, what are you doing? Do you know what you're doing? Should I see someone else? It, it is, it is, but it's not 50% because we make the wrong incision. It's 50% because there is probably an occult fistula present that is not visible in the setting of the dramatic inflammation of an abscess. And when things calm down, it will probably continue to drain and it's probably something that's less bothersome, bothersome than an abscess. And so they may also have had it initially and not been aware of it. You know, little things like spotting or something like that is probably masked by, you know, a, a big area of pus um, in a very sensate area. Um, and so, yes, so I would quote them 50-50 in terms of the rate of development. And it's not related to bad surgery, unless you like really don't know what you're doing. I suppose you could create a fistula. Um, but it's, it's likely there even before the operation. And so the, the um, fistulae that are, so abscesses are named for their relation to spaces. Fistulae are named for their relation to sphincters. That's also something that frequently you'll ask someone a type and they'll tell you, you'll ask them what type of abscess it is and they'll tell you a fistula type. And you have to kind of like politely be like, hey, Never mind, or like you know, like, you know, like ask them again, that sort of thing. It's always uncomfortable, um, but so I have them labeled. They're labeled here A, B, C, D, E. We'll start with A. If anyone knows knows what A is, yeah, submucosal or superficial or perianal. Um, B, intersphincteric. C, uh huh. D. Yeah, super sphincter. Yeah. I like the group think. You guys are like conferring and then. Okay. Okay. Um, and then this, this is my last slide, but really, um, <clears throat> this again has important implications for how you're going to manage these. Um, whether you're going to do a fistulotomy and open the tract and curatage it versus uh, place a seton, if you want your seton to be draining or cutting. 
uh, and then whether or not you need to do more advanced maneuvers like an endoanal advancement flap. Um, so the general kind of rule of thumb is, I mean, bets are off if someone has preoperative incontinence, but in someone with normal preoperative continence, you can divide the internal sphincter in one place and you can divide up to a third of the external sphincter and generally be okay. So these you know, superficial or submucosal, you just open. Intersphincteric, you can generally just open. Transphincteric, if they're very low, some people will call those simple transphincteric or non-complicated. Those can be opened if they involve less than a third of the external sphincter. If it involves more than a third and you go dividing that, you will give someone incontinence that will probably not recover. And that is something that will be you know, a surgeon's fault and nobody will be happy. But this is an ins a situation where a seton would be a good idea. It could be converted to a, a cutting seton if it's higher up. Um, same with suprasphincteric. Um, and this is also something that after using a seton, if it does recur or fail, um, frequently it will recur and become an intersphincteric kind of at the site of a skin incision. And that can be, you know, allowed to fibrose and ma uh, mature for a little bit before being reopened and simplified. Sometimes these would need an endoanal advancement flap, but rarely. The, the extra sphincteric are those that you start to think about um, doing more complex procedures, uh, namely an endoanal advancement flap. And then the one other procedure that I didn't talk about for high transphincteric is the lift procedure or ligation of the intersphincteric fistless tract, uh, where you would place a seton, it'd just be a draining seton, let the area mature, fibrose, you make an incision between, oh, between the sphincters, you can, you can palpate this on exam in the operating room. You make an incision, you dissect up around it, doubly ligate and, and divide it. And then you test that your, your closure is watertight. My right? injection is something like hydrogen peroxide, sorry. Fistula plugs are, are not great. Uh, the recurrence rate is you know, 50, 60%. We don't use them frequently. I've never used one in training. The Markel will use them occasionally and, and she um, the times that she will use it, um, and that it does make sense because the fistula is like a high resistance fistula. It's like long circuitous and narrow as opposed to short, um, just in terms of the overall resistance of the tract are those that are, um, you know, like high and complex and would otherwise require something more invasive and they're long and circuitous. Uh, and the one benefit of them is you don't really burn any bridges. If a fistula plug fails, I don't know who's joining us. Hey, Beth. Um, uh, it doesn't, it doesn't affect any future procedures in terms of additional cetons or other things like that. Um, sometimes that is something that if used for a suprasphincteric shown here in D and that failed, it might fail through an old skin incision and again, become an intersphincteric. And then this, the management is much simplified. So 